we hope you've had a good one so far, and uh, let me be the first to, well, not the first, but welcome you to the month of March as far as a, a church standpoint. Uh, and it's just crazy to believe that we're one month away from Resurrection Weekend and that we get to have this huge celebration. One of the things I'm really excited about is this worship night where we can just come and, and observe uh, the crucifixion of Jesus together uh, with song and with prayer. And uh, we just, it's just in a very intentional way that hopefully we can bring everybody together and, and bring the community in uh, just to observe this, this significant historical event that still sends ripples through uh, human history. And then the golden ticket tour. If you, if, you, if you put anything with Willy Wonka on it, I'm there, right? Because we're talking chocolate, we're talking candy. Well, the golden ticket tour is going to be just that. Uh, families are going to have a chance to go through these different stations uh, that are candy-based. And it's just going to be a fun time in order to, in order to also to, to observe the resurrection of Jesus. And then to bring everybody together at 10 a.m. on Sunday, April 9th for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we're, let's just, we're just going to pack this place out because there's no greater celebration that we can have as God's people than to witness to and to be able to celebrate his resurrection. So we hope you can be here to experience the hope of Jesus and to celebrate with us. And for this morning, we're going to begin a new series, and that new series is called Immovable. And quite simply, the big question this month is, where do we turn when life takes a turn, right? Where, where do we turn when life takes a turn? Because it is a guarantee, as many here will probably attest, that a life lived in faith is not a life that is lived solely on the mountaintop. It's a, li it's a life that does have these great highs, but it also is a life that has some great lows. It's a life that has a lot of treks into a dark valley. And belief in Jesus and faith in God, man, it's so much easier on the mountaintop than it is in the valley, right? So what do we do when our life, in those moments in our lives, what do we do when we come off that mountaintop and all of a sudden we take a dip into that dark valley? What do we do? Where do we turn? Specifically, what do we do when our faith is being tested? What do we do in the midst of temptation? What do we do when we feel isolated from God? What do we do when life feels empty and life feels unsatisfied? What do we do when we feel overwhelmed by everything? What do we do when we just feel overwhelmed? The answer to those questions we're going to look at week to week this month. But if you remember, we spent our entire summer looking at spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits that are critical to the life of every believer critical to the life of every believer. We talked about why they're vital. We talked about how those spiritual disciplines are beneficial for us. So this morning, we're going to kind of take those and we're going to go a step further. And we're going to find out how these different disciplines help us in these different stages of struggles that we face. And while I obviously, like I stand here today, and I believe that these spiritual disciplines are so important as we navigate our lives, you know, it was actually reinforced to me a couple weeks ago at midweek. You see, every few years in our student group at midweek, we do a series called Hard Questions. And it's a series where students basically create a top, they create the topics of teaching over the next few weeks based on questions that they submit. So a couple of weeks ago, we introduced this, and we talked about, man, it is so important to ask the tough questions. You see, students don't leave the faith. High schoolers don't leave the faith because they don't like the answers that they hear. They leave the faith because they feel like their answers are not addressed at all. And that's a big thing. So this series says, look, ask them, submit them, let's go. Let's not leave nothing on the table, and let's go through those questions and explore them together. 
and they submitted their questions at the end of this. And I took the questions and I kind of put them into major categories. And what I discovered, what I discovered is that the highest percentage of questions submitted, 25%, one out of every four questions that were submitted that night from about 26, 27 students were questions about a relationship with God. A relationship with God. And, that, and that's to be expected, I think, right? But what I also notice is that a majority of those questions kind of have a common thread going through them. Questions like, how come it feels like God is silent when I need him the most? Why does it seem like I can't get an answer to my prayers? You know, where is Jesus when life gets tough for me? That's big. I see those questions, and the first thing I do when I see those questions is I just look at it and I go, I get it. I get it. And I'm willing to bet that even the adults that are sitting in this room have felt the same way before. Have, I mean, I'll, I'll test to that. I have felt this way many, many times. That's why we believe this series is so important for us to explore together. Now, if you notice, the passage of Scripture that is the focus for the entire month comes from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 8. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet who delivered God's pronouncement of judgment on Judah and Israel. That was, his, he, that was what he was called to do. God's going to judge you. Jeremiah, I want you to go and pronounce my judgment to them. And very simply, God's people were turning away from him, and they were turning to idols for worship, and they were looking to human means in order to meet their needs. And Jeremiah was sent to deliver a pretty hard message to God's people. You're going to be judged and you're going to be handed over to a foreign enemy that's going to take you over. And after this, sure enough, the Babylonian Empire would come in, and they would defeat Israel and Judah, and God's people would live in slavery to Babylon. And here in chapter 17, Jeremiah would communicate God's words that, hey, your sins are going to be marked on you. You're going to lose your possessions and you're going to become slaves to this enemy that's going to come in. He said, hey, I'm just letting you know, this is what God is telling me is going to happen. And then beginning in verse 5, God begins to speak and paints a different picture. And it's a picture of these differences between people who trust in the world and men and those who trust in the Lord. This is from verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. And then he paints a picture of the opposite. And this is the section that kind of includes our, our key verse for the month, and it's from verse 7. But... Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. That's where we want to be. Right? That's where we want to be. We want to be people whose roots are firm. We want to be people that plant ourselves and establish our roots near the stream of life. And I don't know if you noticed, but the one thing that didn't change between the, the people who depend on the world and people who depend on the Lord, the one thing that didn't change here were the conditions. The environmental conditions of both plants are the same from a weather standpoint. Both of these plants, in the example, are susceptible to drought. They are susceptible to scorched heat. They are susceptible to harsh conditions. But where 
are you setting your roots? Where am I setting my roots? Are they planted in the philosophy and the beliefs of this own world? Are they planted in our own ability to try to help ourselves? Or are they planted near the streams of life where total trust with Jesus and we're firmly rooted in the spiritual disciplines? Where are we planting our roots? When the weather gets rough, and the seasons come, and they're going to come, seasons, seasons of testing, your faith's going to be tested, seasons of isolation, seasons of emptiness, seasons where we feel like we are just overwhelmed. Is, are those seasons going to blow us away like the scorched heat blows away the tumbleweed, or will we remain immovable? That's what this month is all about. And we just, as we set this up and we're planning this, we just hope and we pray that this is a benefit for you, especially as we move into the season of observing Easter. So this morning, we're asking the question, what do we do when our faith is tested? What do we do when our faith is tested? And in order to address this, we're going to turn, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. Feel free to use those, those the paper bi- paperback Bibles. Feel free to open up that Bible app uh, and just follow along as we go through. Because th- this is one of those accounts that leaves me just reading it. And the first thing that I think when I read it is just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for for not just giving me an instruction. Thank you for not just giving us this bulletproof way of dealing with testing and temptation. Thank you so much for coming down and living it out. Thank you for giving me an example that I could follow. And this is what separates our God from the others, right? This is what separates our God from anything else. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. He said, for we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. We have a God who came down and he experienced these same feelings. He overcame those feelings And through his example, he has given us a blueprint on how to do the same. And the paramount example of this is here in Matthew 4. And Jesus is about to begin his ministry. So let's start with me. Start with me at verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I want to stop here a minute. I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that Jesus was led into the wilderness for testing and temptation by who? You can say it if you know it. Yeah, no. No. The Spirit. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Because all too often we assume that that following a life of Jesus is a life that's void of testing. Man, if I just follow Jesus, I'm not going to be tested anymore. I'm going to have a firm faith. I'm not going to have any hardship. I'm not going to question. I'm not going to doubt. But the reality is sometimes we are led into these seasons of testing because getting through them is going to make us better. Because getting through these seasons is going to give us an opportunity to lean into faith, to lean into Jesus, and lean into these disciplines that we will see Jesus do here. Paul said it also in Romans chapter 5. He said, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of the Lord. That's awesome, but he's not done. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Our God has redeemed suffering. 
He has not eliminated it, but he's redeemed it. He's redeemed hardship. He's redeemed testing as something that when we go through it can ultimately be good for us. Why? Because for every test, there is growth on the other side of it. For every pain that we feel, there is healing on the other side of it. For the pain of the cross, there is the glory of resurrection. Thank God. Thank God he's redeemed that. And also, can we just admit this one of these most underrated passages of Scripture? For 40 days and 40 nights, he was fasting, and he was hungry, <laughs> right? I'm, fast, I'm, I'm hungry after fasting for 40 minutes. I feel like that's just like the most underrated thing ever. Hey, guess what? He was hungry after not eating anything for 40 days. Anyway, let's move on. That's just a yeah. From verse 3, the tempter came to him, and he said, if you are the Son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It's written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. So Jesus is being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and he's tempted here recorded three times. He's first tempted to use his power to give yourself food. Man, you've been hungry for 40 days. You have the power? Just tell that stone to become bread so that you can eat something. He's then tempted to create this amazing display using his power in order to save himself and go and put on this grand show for everybody that's in the temple courts. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to stand there and see Jesus just jump off the building and then soar on angels' wings into the temple area? Wouldn't that be amazing? That's the way I would imagine a Messiah that was going to come and save us would do. He's then tempted to skip ahead. You know what, Jesus, you can skip ahead and just win it all. Yeah, I'll, I'll back up. I'll give up. I'll, I will give you dominion over all the world. You can have it. Just worship me. We'll work together. And what the temptations all have in common is that the devil is tempting Jesus to focus more on himself and use his authority as the son of man on himself rather than the fulfillment of the father's plan. Jesus is set there for a plan. And the devil's saying, don't follow that plan. You have the power. I know who you are. Don't mistake the fact that the devil knows exactly who Jesus is because the devil's trying to tempt him to use the power that he could easily use. Even the demons know when they shudder. Don't follow that plan, Jesus, because you know that plan's more painful, right? That path's more painful. You know, you can, you can serve yourself and you can feed yourself rather than focusing on, on, on serving humanity. You know, you, you can enter the temple as a glorious king. You don't have to ride some lowly donkey into the temple courts. You've got the power to do this, man. Jesus, you can have the kingdoms of the world, and you can avoid that cross. Isn't that what you want? Doesn't that sound good? And did you catch how Jesus responded to each of these temptations? What did he do? Yeah, he quoted scripture. He actually quoted passages from the book of Deuteronomy. He said, it, it's written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He says, it, it's written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
you know, Satan, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. How did Jesus face temptation and how did he face testing? Say it with me. It is written. One more time for the people in the back. It is written. How is Jesus showing us to handle our seasons of testing and our seasons of temptation that come our way? It is written. We got to be in his word. We've got to be in the scriptures. As we said before, Jesus, Jesus was tempted to take matters into his own hands and, and do what he had the power to do on that moment. Jesus, and, and let's not lose sight of the fact that Jesus was tempted. It wouldn't be a temptation if he was not tempted to follow the devil's yearnings. He could have focused on himself. He could have made these concessions and avoided everything. Because testing and temptation really comes down to one question. Are you going to focus on yourself? Or will you depend on the one who created you for a plan and for a purpose? In this moment of testing, in this moment of temptation that you might feel, do you trust more in your ability Or do you trust his plan for you? Jesus quoted scripture because he knew from scripture that the father had a plan laid out for him. Jesus knew from scripture that the father has a mission that he was on. Much in the same way, on the eve of his crucifixion, you know, he was tested again. Right up to the cross, he was tested in the garden of Gethsemane. And maybe this time there wasn't a literal devil in his ear. But boy, was he tempted. He pleaded with the Father, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. In other words, what he's saying is, please, Father, if there is some other way that doesn't go through a painful cross, can we do it that way? Can we do it that way? And I find myself praying that all the time. If there's a way that I could avoid this testing and avoid this temptation and avoid the suffering, can we do it that way? But just as he did in the wilderness, he submits to the Father by saying, yet not my will be done, but your will be done. It's not my words, Father. It's your words. And I know it's like a broken record when you might come into this place and we say, you got to read your Bible. And we don't just implore you to pick up your Bibles just to try to learn something. We quite literally believe that the words of Scripture have the power to change our lives. Because in his pages, we see the heart of God, right? What we talked about last month, through the pages of Scripture, we see what God cares about. But also more than that, we see who God is. We see how his plan has unfolded throughout human history. We see his promises. Through scripture, we see his goodness. Through scripture, we see his wrath. And through scripture, we see his judgment. We see his intentions. We see his creativity. We see his love. We can read how everything begins. And we can also see how he's going to bring it all to an end. And most of all, we see how far he was willing to go to let you know that you are loved. Friends, scripture is not just basic instructions. They're life. They're life. And when we devote ourselves to the scriptures, we are establishing our roots into that good soil by the stream of water we read in Jeremiah. When we face tempting and when we face, when we face testing and temptations, it's his words through scripture that help us to become immovable. And when we devote ourselves to scripture, we're not, we're not just sitting back and saying, I'm going to read it, so I'm going to read it front to back like a novel. It's a lifetime of, 
of reading. It's a lifetime of processing. We take our time with it. We chew on every word. We chew on every verse because we don't just read scripture. We meditate on scripture. And if you remember, we talked about meditation. We talked about how the word there used for meditate is the same that's there for a a cow chewing cud for all the farmers here. Or there's this constantly consuming, chewing, swallowing, bringing it back up, chewing it some more, and, and getting it down just all to get every single nutrient out of that bite that we can. And man, when I think about all of this, it gets me fired up because now I, I, I think about those questions submitted before by, by students, and I just can't wait to get into this and talk about this. You know why? Because, man, maybe, maybe God feels distant in our testing because we haven't spent the time to understand who he is and how he works. We haven't taken the time to read what exactly he's doing when I'm going through this. We haven't really fully meditated on the words of Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. We haven't even considered the journey of questioning and doubt that was experienced in Job's life. If you're you're doubting your faith, if you're questioning how God is working, man, Job is such a resource in order to see how he, not only he, but his friends and how all this is processed in the midst of his grief. Man, it's a powerful, powerful scripture for us. Why isn't God here when I'm going through testing? Maybe it's because we haven't allowed that double-edged sword to pierce our soul and spirit, our joint and our marrow. We haven't allowed it to judge the thoughts and attitudes and actions of our hearts. Maybe we've looked at it and we say, okay, I'm confused, I'm going to close it, but maybe we haven't really fully submitted to it in order for it to do what it was created to do. And I don't know where you are right now, when it comes to your relationship with Jesus and whether you're going through some kind of testing and temptation at the moment. But I do know this. We have this amazing gift at our fingertips of Scripture. Through Scripture, we have the words of God speaking into our lives. We have the voice of God speaking into our lives. So let's open it up and let's listen. Let's listen. Let's surround ourselves with the family of God, the family of this church, in order to help ourselves understand, in order to give our perspectives on what this scripture means in its context. Let's support each other and let's open the scripture and let's let it change who we are. I want to leave this morning with one more passage, and it speaks to the heart of the disciples, and it speaks to the devotion that they had. And it was a devotion that was not just what Jesus did. You see, Jesus had said some pretty crazy things after this huge crowd began following him around. Right? He had just fed 5,000 people. And if I see somebody that's like, hey, out out of this little bit, I can feed you, I'm going to be like, that guy can feed me. I'm going to follow him wherever he goes. Right? I'm never going to be hungry anymore. And a lot of people just started following him after this because they wanted more food. Man, maybe Jesus will get us some more stuff. Maybe he'll put on this grand show that I will be a witness to. That would be awesome. So Jesus sees this and he turns around and he gives them a tough teaching. He gives them a pretty tough teaching. He says, no. He says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. He says, he, he said, you remember when, you're, when, when, when your people were in the wilderness in Exodus and you ate that manna in the desert? That was me. I was the manna in the desert in Exodus. And then he got a little more weird for all the fans. He told them that whoever, whoever you know what, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have eternal life. It's no wonder why he didn't give into the temptation to feed himself in the wilderness because his mission wasn't to feed himself. His mission was to give himself as bread for the world to take in. 
So that was weird. And a lot of people walked away from him that day and said, who can understand what he's saying? Let's get out of here. So this big crowd just leaves, right? And, and then, so Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, what about you? Are, are you, are you going to walk away? They're, they're leaving. Are you going to walk away? And their response is something we need to hear. John 6, 68. Peter looked at him and said, where else are we going to go? He didn't say, where else are you going to go? Because uh, you're our source of sustenance, man. Give me more bread, more fish. He didn't say, well, where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to see these epic miracles? Where else are we going to go? Uh, we love this mountain high experience, this mountaintop experience. He said, no, you have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. Jesus has give, freely given himself to us, and he has freely given himself for us. He said so himself again to the devil in the wilderness. He said, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is the word that became flesh, gave himself for the sins of the world. Man, let's, let's get into our scriptures and let's feast on his words so that when the time of testing and temptation comes, we can stand up to it. We can plant ourselves firm and become immovable. And let's not just do that in a vacuum and in a silo, but let's do that together. So at this time, we want to offer an invitation for those who uh, maybe, maybe you're ready to profess Jesus for the first time. I, I, I believe that Jesus is my Lord. I believe that Jesus is my Savior. And when you do that, we immediately say, man, we, we want to get you baptized. We want to get you immersed because in baptism, we make the decision to say, it's no longer about me. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to be laid down into the water, laid at rest, my old sins, my old self, my old identity, and then rise out of the water into new life, a new creation filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to begin following Jesus. So if you want to make that decision this morning, the baptistry is ready. It's always ready. Just come forward as we sing this song. But if you have been attending on Sundays for a while, and, and you've, you're already baptized, you made that decision, but you want to officially join our FCC family as a member, which is, which is another way of basically saying, I want to be part of this family of believers. That when I do feel like, man, I don't, I, I, I'm trying to read this, but I don't know, I don't know what, what God is trying to tell me, that we can surround ourselves with our church family and we can talk about it and we can have that support in order to try to understand what God is trying to say. That we can be a part of a family that prays with each other, that prays for each other, and that is accountable to each other. A family that gives toward a mission that is greater than ourselves. I wanna be part of that family officially. I wanna come forward and say, yes, this is my name, this is what I believe, and I wanna be part of this church family. So if either of those apply to you this morning, we invite you to come forward during this song. Let's stand together and let's sing our song of invitation.